Welcome, welcome to Rum AI number five. Uh, we're old hands now, we've been doing this a while. Thanks, thanks for showing up, it's nice to see so many new faces here. All right, well let's kick off with Graham Lee from Wealth Wizards. So, um, that's me, that's what I do. Being head of architecture means my job isn't to understand anything, it's to understand things to a superficial enough level that I can find someone else and go, you know what, Paul was working on exactly that thing, you should go and talk to Bob. Which means that this is going to be your superficial, I think you should go and talk to Bob, uh, introduction to the ontology. In fact, Bob is really called Bob, he's over there, he's the, the person who actually has the uh, expertise in ontology. Um, I'm just the person who is silly enough to stand up and uh, talk to you all about it. What a mistake that they have to when there is an expert in the world. Um, so what we're going to look at is um, what, what am I talking about? What is this subject? What are ontologies? Why, why should I buy one from you, Greg? Um, having decided that I want to buy one, have a, well, actually, I'm going to give you the secrets for free. Um, having decided that I want one, how do I make it, and what do I get out of that? So, what is it? Well, the, it's the most pretentious word in the entire technology, which is why I latched onto it straight away, is yes, that's the thing that I want to be associated with. This is um, the, the study, the suffix is uh, studying, learning, uh, writing, and the prefix is to be. So it is studying that which is, which is the most awesome and pretentious subject in the world. What we want to do, um, and we'll, we'll come on to why we want to do this, but um, for the moment let's accept that we want to do this. What we want to do is to build a model of how the bit of the world works that we're interested in. And we were talking earlier about um, semantic web technologies, and that's where you, you kind of have representations of things in the world and relationships between things in the world as, um, you know, as kind of objects, as documents out on the web, and a hyperlinked graph of the relationships between them. Now, I want that graph to represent real relationships. So I want, you know, if I, if I say that this is an employer and they have employees, that's the thing that makes sense. If it's an employer and I say that they have uh, deck chairs, well, that might make sense if it's an employer that makes deck chairs, but that's coincidentally correct. It's not something that, like, really makes sense in the world. Um, and that's what we want to do uh, with... Uh, with artificial intelligence systems as well. We want to be able to build things that make sense, where if we derive an inference, it's something that can actually be actioned and that actually you know, has some meaning to either the process that we're trying to improve or you know, to the, uh, the problem that we're trying to solve. There's a footnote that due to the um, aspect ratio is not shown here. We're, what we're trying to do is not solutionize at this point. I'm not yeah, I, I've kind of talked about semantic web, I've talked about AI. Those are things to which we can apply an ontology. It could be an object-oriented uh, data model. It could be a, a set of like, relational uh, tables in a SQL database. We're trying to avoid any relationship with software at this point, because we're not modeling our software system. We're modeling the world so that we can make software systems that support decisions that are relevant in the world. That said, we want to consider some amount of like computer realism. Particularly, we want to come up with inferences uh, and with models where we can make, where, where we can validate the assumptions we're making in some reasonable amount of time. So we'll often choose uh, to express our ontologies in a system where any question that I have about this thing can be answered in polynomial amount of time. That is in n to the sum number given n is the, the, you know, the number of different like, relationships or different properties in this system. Because if we had one that, uh, you know, that was more expressive but where inferences took exponentials, so e to the n amount of time, we might be able to answer like infinitely more questions but not within an amount of time that we could actually kind of action that. Uh, 
as and so we would run, uh, run into the problem that everything would take far too long to do. For example, if I wanted my slides to appear back on this screen. <laughs> there you go. Good. Um, let's move on. So what this allows me to do is without binding, you know, we've got, I'm, I'm talking about not making any assumptions about technology at this point. I'm saying I want a real world model, not a description of a software system. And that means that without a description of my software system, I can be confident that my software system is compatible in some way with some other software system, because they both model the same reality. So it might be that I've got some you know, uh, RESTful API, and I can make queries about this data and load it into that uh, system. It might be that I take a, you know, I run my, my SQL dump, then do an ETL, and then throw the stuff into MongoDB or something. It might be that I take the, um, yeah, the, the, the answers that are coming out to a recurrent neural network and, load, and print them out on paper and give them to someone to type into an Excel spreadsheet. That doesn't matter. The technology doesn't matter. What matters is that the facts that are represented and derived in each of these systems are compatible with one another, that they are all giving answers to the same set of questions, they're all representing the same thing in the world. And they don't have to be my system, so you know, it could be that as someone who works um, a financial technology company, I want to be able to take data from a bank about their customers and load it into my system. Well, if we all agree what a customer at a bank is, and what their relationship with the bank is, and you know, what an account is, and the fact that they can have multiple accounts, and so on, then we can agree that that data is going to make sense. If I just like sat in my you know, startup jeans, and my startup Domino's pizza, and made a thing that like, answered my question, but that didn't represent the same idea of a bank and an account and an account holder as this bank had, then it may be that not only are our data in incompatible formats, but they fundamentally cannot be reconciled. They don't represent the same things. And then, you know, legacy wetware systems are the kind of things where I'm typing some JavaScript in my startup pants. They're ones that are made by squishy human brains rather than like awesome digital brains. But we're, what we're typically doing in the space of AI is either solving a bunch of problems that we knew we wanted to solve with software but couldn't quite you know, do either in reasonable time or with reasonable money um, given a, you know, a room full of programmers and some MacBooks and a beer fridge and a football table. Or uh, we're trying to make an existing software solution faster or uh, yeah, scale it up to support more uh, use cases than it uh, currently does, or like solve closely related problems to its current problems. Um, and so we want to make sure that our AI has a, a view of the world and is able to give us facts, uh, able to derive um, like inferences about our problem space that are compatible with our understanding of the problem space. So ontology is not itself an AI tool, but it's a damn useful tool in the AI world because it gives us the ability to know that the thing that is represented in our uh, AI system is the thing that we think it is. You know, so um, I see a Star Wars uh, t-shirt over here. If I had a, uh, a thing that learned all, you know, that I fed all of the scripts from uh, a bunch of films in, and then it told me that like, the, the most likely captain of the Enterprise in the next Star Wars film would be Patrick Stewart. You know, that, that's definitely a thing that we could get out of an AI system, right? We've had uh, experiments with chatbots where it gets like relationships. It says subject, predicate, object, and it goes, uh, you know, peep is big. Peep is wealth wizards. Wealth wizards is Levington Spa. Levington Spa is uh, town. Great, that one was true. That one fact that you managed to pull out of like listening to all of this text was true. However, it's not relevant to the problem we're trying to solve. So that's the other thing we get out of this, is constraint. We can reject 
all of the things where we, you know, learnt an association between things that isn't true. Um, like uh, a, a common problem that we find if we're trying to build uh, like decision tree based AIs is overfitting, where it will go, okay, so you know, you you've given us all of this information about these, um, you know, these people, and asked us to uh, make a decision on, like. Uh, what, which savings account they should have. And we've noticed that people with odd numbered account numbers are better off in this type of account, and people with even numbered account numbers are best off in that type of account. Well, you know, maybe there is some like noise in the data that's leading to that conclusion, but it doesn't make any sense, does it? Um, you know, there's no, unless it, it happens to be that the bank reserves odd numbered, they, you know, flips the, the lowest bit for one type of account or something. The likelihood that that's a real fact uh, just it doesn't make much sense. So if we've got a, a, a system that describes our reality and we make sure that the things we learn conform to that reality, then we know a lot more about the statements that we're making and they're probably a lot more justifiable. So we're going to uh, talk about how we do this now um, and I'm going to use a system called First Order Logic. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about computability. I don't need to use first order logic. I could describe an ontology in uh, wishy wishy washy sentences in you know, something that's vaguely English. Um, but then we'd need a system to be able to interpret those sentences before we could uh, do anything with them. I could use uh, a higher order logic. So first order logic has like collections of things, properties on things, relationships between things and functions. If you try to build a set out of a function, or a function that uses a function, or a property that is a function, then you, what you're doing is higher order logic, because you're using higher, higher order functions, so you're chaining these functions. That increases the computational cost of making any, um, uh, any inferences based on this model. So we're going to constrain ourselves to first order logic, not because we need to, but because we want to because it means that we're going to get things that we've got a fighting chance of understanding because we're not using a very complicated logic in order to describe them and that the computer has got a fighting chance of solving in a reasonable amount of time so that our AI is actually faster than doing this thing by hand. So, examples. I have categories. I can define a category by what's called an extensional definition where I say, here are the things in this category. So the three stooges are Larry, Curly, and Moe. <coughs> like that, that defines that set, uh, absolutely. Now I could do that for bigger sets. Like, uh, imagine that I went out and found uh, every yucca plant on the planet. And went, this is the yucca plant. This is the yucca plant. That's the yucca plant. That's not a yucca plant. You're not here. That building over there is not. Yeah, th this would take a long time, right? We're, we're all bored of me doing this already. <laughs> I'm bored of me doing this. Um, and we've got one yucca plant and two kind of fake mime acting yucca plants. So imagine I actually did this for all of the yucca plants in the, on the whole planet. It is possible, but it would be done. So what we can also do is um, define a set of our predicates. So the three stooges are Larry, Curly, and Moe. But a stooge is a character in a comedy who doesn't have any jokes. It's the straight guy in the comedy. Now, here is where reality throws us a curveball because not everything that we might want to do can be defined absolutely in those terms. Um, so, yeah, we could define a swan as a member of the species Cygnus, but then how did we define a species Cygnus? Well, it's everything that is a swan. So we haven't helped ourselves out there. So a swan is like a bird that's about that big and it's white and it lives on the water. And some of them are only that big, that's probably a swan. And some of them are black and that's probably a swan. So we're kind of saying like, you know, we've got this vague idea. And maybe for, like, you know, for our kind of MVP AI, the first idea is sufficient. Maybe if our bird watch detection system only works for white swans, like, you know, we've still got uh, a valuable thing. But what are we going to do when, when we come up with an exception? 
Uh, well, I can't answer that question because it depends on your business and how much you care about swans. But it's a problem that we're going to have to uh, think about. So given categories, we can then make statements about categories. This category of things is a specific example of this category of things. So we said that stooges were characters in uh, comedy routines with zero jokes, which means that a stooge is part of a comedy routine. If you've got, uh, if you've got a straight guy, a full guy, some jokes, and, um, and a laugh track, maybe, if it's not very funny, then you've got a comedy routine. If you've got a comedy routine, and a musical routine, and a gymnast, and a theatre, then you've got a variety show. So this is my partition. You know, if I've got a kidney, and another kidney, and some other bits, then I've got a body. Right? Uh, so we can say that things are composed out of other things. We can also say that things are specific types of other things. So a stooge, anything that is a stooge is also a character. Now, those of us who have like, done any object-oriented programming and hit some pain points at this point are probably recoiling in horror and going, oh God, is he talking about single inheritance, multiple inheritance, prototype inheritance? You don't need to care. Like, you know, we're, we're not talking about technical solutions here. We're saying that this thing is true. So I could say that like, um, you know, an arm is, uh, is a limb. So an arm is a specific type of a limb. I could also say that an arm is a specific type of an articulated thing. Both one or both of those could be relevant to the problem that I'm trying to solve. Um, but it doesn't mean that I need a programming language that's got multiple inheritance to solve my problem. I just know that these that these two facts are true, right? And now I can say that you know, it's not. If uh, it, it is true that uh, all of the things in this category, in this category, have this property, so um, for all things that are actors, uh, the role that an actor takes is an example of a character. That hopefully is not too uh, controversial. Maybe the. The awesome LaTeX is a bit hard to read, but the um, the idea is not controversial. Um, if I am an actor, then I have a role, and that role is one of the characters here in the play. I mean. That's the, that so far is not very exciting. Where, where it gets still not very exciting is that we can also add constraints. So I can say that for any mammal. There are at most two kidneys on the mammal um, because some of us have had a kidney removed, so we might only have one kidney. Some of us might be like, permanently on uh, dialysis and have no kidneys, but we probably all have fewer than two. Uh, and I can say that you know, some things, like there, there is an object that takes multiple roles within my system. So the guy who played Dr. Strangelove in Dr. Strangelove is the guy who played Captain Mandrake in Doctor Strangelove. And the guy who played Captain Mandrake in Doctor Strangelove is the guy who played Mercury Muffy in Doctor Strangelove. And this is where we start to get like, um, you know, useful things out of it, because if we've got constraints, then we know that you know, if we feed the entire of Rotten Tomatoes into our AI and ask it for some inferences, and it says, well, Peter Sellers played Doctor Strangelove and um, Valerie Singleton played Captain Mandrake, you know, we know that we've done something wrong, right? And this is, this is a useful place to be. You can either have, you can have a complete ontology. So you can say like, right, so the name of an actor is a, is a name. A name is a string with like certain amounts of spaces and rules on names are really hard, so I recommend not going there, but it is possible to build rules on names and define the ontology for a valid name. Or you can say, um, that an actor has a name, someone else has told me what a name is, I don't care. Um, but we don't need, like, the, I'm going to show you an example. An example show took me about uh, 20 minutes to do uh, on Monday morning. Like, we're not, we don't need to go overboard on defining every single thing that is true of all of the things we're working on. We need to define every single thing that is useful to us. 
So those of us who were alive in the 90s might recognize this as like the first couple of steps in an object-oriented analysis and design thing. We're looking at the world going, what are the things and what are the relationships between these things? We're not going as far as what are the actions that these things can do and how do I represent that in Java? But we are you know, using some of our skills from software development to uh, build these models. So I read a lot of research papers. And my I might have a, an app that kind of lets me record these and the notes I make on them. And then an AI that says, you fact, you know, here's some other papers you might want to read because they, they might be useful. And um, I thought about this for about 20 minutes and came up with this. Like, I kind of built this in a sort of vaguely UML sense just so they all fit on one slide, but you know, what we have is a collection of things and relationships between these things and a bunch of really difficult questions to answer about it. So I've said that a person has names. Well, there's, there, there's ethical considerations now. You know, we're now into ethics, and I was talking about ontology just now. A problem that a lot of women have in academia is that if they get married and change their name, then their publication history stops and starts again because the software systems, the citation indices that track them under first name maiden name don't track them under first name married name, they lose that association. Sophie Wilson, who's an engineer at ARM, didn't always go by the name Sophie Wilson. She had a different name when she worked uh, for Acorn. She published under her like, you know, previous name and under her new name, but uh, if you just search like Google Scholar for Sophie Wilson, you don't find any of the things that were published under Roger Books. So, you know, we're exclude if we say a person has a name, we are excluding people. We are being unethical. So, this is there's a hard problem to solve. But I could probably find two people who called Sophie Wilson if I wanted to. So I need some way to identify people that isn't their name. Now, what's that? I don't know. Does the paper have zero or more authors? Like, who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Do I say that Satoshi is an author? But I, I don't know whether that's a person or not. It could be a group of people. It could be a, a, a wombat with amazing typing skills, I suppose. And then, so, but anyway, like there are authors and there are papers, and often you find that papers have uh, keywords. Now, does that mean that the keyword is an intrinsic part of the paper, or does it mean that someone has attached these keywords to the paper? How does that work? You know, again, we're kind of, we're uncovering a lot of questions about what we're trying to solve, just by drawing a box and arrow stuff around that, how this uh, problem works. <coughs> but I've decided that I, as a reader, who am also a person, find some papers useful and written notes about some of those papers and the papers, well, were they published anywhere? You know, if, if I get a personal communication, do I say publish first con, as you'll often see in the footnote in a, an article, or do I say unpublished, which means there are no publications? Again, we've got to, uh, we've got to work this one out um, when we model the thing. But now we can build our recommendation engine, or at least we can identify the questions that we might want our recommendation to ask engine to answer. If I found some papers useful because they're written by an author, I might want to read their other papers. I love Alan Kay. I would read anything that Alan Kay ever wrote. But obviously the one Alan Kay who is the guy in Xerox Park, not some other random Alan Kay who writes on Europe, I wonder. If papers have keywords that I find useful, then I might want uh, similar keywords. You know, th these are um, the obvious things we might want from a recommendation engine. If we think about like a, a graph and vertex model, we have this this reader finds that paper useful and that paper useful. This reader finds that paper useful, or well, they might find that paper useful. But what we wouldn't want our engine to say is this reader finds that paper and that paper useful. Maybe that paper should read that paper. That makes no sense. But the the reason we know it makes no sense is because we are we understand what readers and papers and their relationship to each other is. It makes sense because we have an ontology, a concrete description of the part of reality that we're trying to solve a problem in, that's built in such a way that we can understand it as people, that computers can build inferences on it in a reasonable amount of time, and that lets us guide our facts and build knowledge bases that contain not just knowledge but wisdom. 
Dobro.